And welcome to another edition of Match Points here on TennisMajors.com, where we come to debate and discuss the biggest topics in tennis as we reach the end of the 2021 season. Say hello once again to our steam panel. There she is, tennis great and now media journalist extraordinaire, Marian Bartoli. Also, tennis writer and author and personality, Carl Bouchard. And finally, as always, once again, tennis journalist, media personality, um, extraordinary in his own way as well, Mr. Simon Cambers. Can we honestly say that now there is a legitimate rivalry between Novak Djokovic and one-time Grand Slam champion, Daniil Medvedev? Can we say that there really is a rivalry? Can you quantify that, justify that? And B, can Medvedev actually compete with Djokovic over the course of an entire season. Let's begin Simon, part A, then part B. If you need a reminder, happy to do such. There's a lot to unpack. Is there a legitimate rivalry, or are we trying to manufacture one, Simon? There's a there's a burgeoning rivalry. It's coming. But the difficulty is that Novak's going to be 35 this year, and he's, you know, he's giving up 10 years to Medvedev. So the chances of there actually being a rivalry for a sustained period of time are, are slim. That said, you know, Medvedev beat him in the US Open, um, yes, there are lots of reasons, you know, why someone beats someone on a given day. But he's got a game that is is pretty much a, a matchup for Djokovic. It's very similar to him. Uh, there is he's got the belief. He's got the he's got the confidence from having done it. So there's a, there's a rivalry that will be there for a couple of years. And there's a you know at some stage there'll come a time when Novak is not the Novak of now. Maybe it'll be five years. Who knows. But uh, for now, Novak still has a big lead over him in, in terms of their experience. I mean, you can't compare someone, you know, it's not a Borg McEnroe. It's not an Ever um, Navrasilova. It's not a Federer Nadal. It can't be because they haven't played the number of times that those guys did and, and in huge finals all over the world. So until that starts happening, then I think we sort of temper down the, the rhetoric a little bit. But, you know, it's coming. It is definitely coming. And part B on that, can Medvedev actually compete with Djokovic over the course of an entire season? Yeah, but not necessarily on every surface. Uh, I mean, Medvedev is still a work in progress on when it comes to clay and grass, whereas Djokovic is defending champion at Wimbledon and Roland Garros. So, you know, he, on the hard court, absolutely. Um, on the other courts, he's still at a distance behind. All right, Martin Bartoli, same question. Is this a rivalry legitimately? Or are we just really kind of reaching right now? No, I, I think, and it's the same for Zverev, to be honest. They both have the level to, to beat Novak at some point, and especially on hard courts. I think I, I entirely agree with, uh, with Simon on clay and on grass, especially for Daniel, it's still a long way to go, and, and especially even more on clay. Um, I think Zverev could be and could have the potential more on clay to go and, and challenge Novak. But yeah, overall, I think those two players are going to be the one who Novak might have some trouble against next year to win more Grand Slams. But I don't think you can call it a rivalry just because the age gap is too huge. I mean, they are not playing in the same era. It's just really, Novak has been playing a decade before and it happens that now those two guys and, and the one, of course, furthermore, with Sinner, Akaraz and whatever, are coming in to challenge him. So I think they're challengers. They're definitely contenders to go and win titles. Absolutely. But you can't call it a rivalry when the age gap is so massive. Carol, I think Marin brings a great point, and that is this is more of an overlap. This is really the end of one era, the beginning of another. Can you have a true? I mean, can you have a true rivalry when that's the case? I mean, for me, it's not a rivalry because it's just Novak trying to delay the change of the guard. I mean, it's the way it should be. Um, it maybe it should have happened three or four years ago, but Novak is so good. Rafa is so good. Roger has been so good. They've been delaying so many <laughs> generations. So, so the age gap is 10 years. It's massive. Unless you tell me Novak is playing until he's 45 at the same level. Yes, okay, they have time, but it will never be the same as Rafa against Novak, Roger and Novak. It's just the electricity in the air is not the same because they've, it, Novak has been through so much with so many of his era. Medvedev is just a young guy who should be overcoming him, but Novak is like, nope. I'm going to stay a bit longer. So how long can he delay this? I think the game is, I mean, for me, is much stronger, but how long the body is going to, to be able to take it because Medvedev is just starting. The guy is, is a machine. He has found his, you know, his momentum. He's not tiring. Zverev is getting, is getting better. Uh, you get the younger guys coming in. I think it's just, there's a both dominating player for me of the year, Medvedev and Djokovic, but it's more, 
time coming, starting to do its job, you know, it's not a rival with, uh, we're changing the guard and Hollande can Novak all the fort. It's, it's more than this. And I don't think it's, it's leaving this as a rivalry. I don't, I don't see any kind of stress or, or, or tension or really, you know, the hunger of, I'm going to bring him down. I don't see that. When he step on the court against Rafa and Roger, he, he wants to nail them. I don't see that with Daniel. So for me, it's just the change of the guard. It's not a rivalry. Yeah, it's, I, I completely agree. And I, I, I'm fascinated by Novak's a willingness to practice with these guys but I think he does it deliberately as well to keep them close and so that they don't feel like that they can take him down they don't hate him they can't you know have that inner sort of killer instinct to, to try to to try to really uh, get the better of him and he, he did it to stand at the when after Vavrinka beat him at the French Open he played he practiced with him next day which I, I find fascinating and I do think there's Federer used to do it with young guys in Dubai bring them along and play and I think there's a little bit of a mental even if it's unconscious it's just keeping them close so that they can't have that killer instinct. Maureen let me ask you that because you understand that there's gamesmanship involved there's intimidation factor involved you know your idol one day your rival when Simon speaks of that and keeping those guys close you nod a little bit what do you know about this what do you think about this? Yeah it's funny that Simon mentioned that because um, my husband is the biggest ever Novak Djokovic fan in the entire planet. So I get to hear about Novak all day long. I get to know everything he's doing every single second. And I get the exact same thinking process as Simon saying, well, you know, he's practicing a lot with those guys, which normally players of those levels don't tend to do because you can actually take a lot from the practice. You know, you can take the, the game patterns, you can take the favorites, serving spot and you can take a lot really when you practice with someone and that's why I think Roger said one day that you know he used to practice with Andy and then when Andy's starting to become really a threat he just stopped that entirely which isn't which is fair it's not against the person it's just the fact that you don't want to show your cards before the match is actually played um, and the fact that Novak is doing it now I think yeah I think he wants to sort of he doesn't want to go into a really hard rivalry with those guys. He wants to play it slightly more friendly and slightly to sort of wrap it around nicely. And I think what um, Zverev said after his match, um, you know, saying that Novak should take so much credit for everything he's doing, etc., just sort of inciting that a little bit as well, um, which I don't think I ever heard Rafael Rogers saying that about Novak or vice versa. So I, I think they're playing in a different way. Um, is it totally conscious? I don't know. I think, um, you know, he, he might be at a sort of a state of his career where he just doesn't want to go into a hard fight again because he's just done it for so many years that he might feel a little bit, a little bit burned down and he wants to play slightly more friendly with the new ones. Um, but I think ultimately what Novak wants is to be that 20 grand slam record. I think it's the only obsession he's having. And when he walked away from that defeat against Sasha, I didn't see in him really a lot of anger or, you know, he was not like massively broke down. Um, I think it just what mattered the most for him now was to beat Pete Sampras' record of finishing the year number one. And now it's to just get to 21 and 22 and even furthermore. So he makes sure that Rafa or Roger can't catch him back. So I think that's going to be the only obsession he's going to have next year. Or, you know, I don't know how many years he still have to play at his best level, probably two or three. But yeah, definitely. It was a surprise to me, and I'm not sure why he's doing it. I'm sure he has only the answer. But I was very surprised that he's practicing so often because it's not only one time, it's really often with those guys. All right, last question looking back before we start to look ahead with prediction time into 2022. Much was made of the Medvedev Zvera final uh, being played predominantly from behind the baseline with two handed backhands, which prompted Patrick McEnroe to say they wouldn't be able to sell tickets to the first week of the U.S. Open. The question is, is this new generation spectacular enough for public interest in the game? Is it spectacular enough, this new generation and how they choose to play the game? Carol, you go first. Well, I don't think the game is an issue because we had those baseline uh, battles with Andy and Novak. Even Rafa and Novak is behind on the baseline but the brilliance of it makes you forget it I mean I don't care they can stay on their baseline for 40 shots rally for hours I'm fine I won't move from my seat I think the issue you might have with Medvedev against Verev is just that the personalities are 
less easy for me to relate to. Uh, the show is different and we've been spoiled for 10 years having three of the greatest players of all time, week in, week out. I mean, it's going to take time to adjust. I don't, I really don't think it's a game issue. I think it's a charisma issue. It's uh, something that you, it's subjective. It's completely subjective, but I, I really don't feel it's about the game. I think if you put Sinner in front of, uh, I don't know, Alcaraz, we're watching. I don't care if they never see the net, you know. I, I just think the issue with Zverev Medvedev is maybe a lack of electricity in the air that makes it less uh, showtime worthy but also they're new maybe in three years we will be like oh my god i can't wait to see this match maybe they need time to have more of those matches because they, they haven't had time to build that rivalry because novak rafa roger are always on the way all right marion uh, patrick mcenroe you know they're, they're not going to sell tickets first week not spectacular w what's the truth here well first of all it's not true because when um, even Tsitsipas played in um, in the US Open this year with all the controversy, obviously with the toilet break and whatever, but despite that, it was absolutely full. I just don't see, I mean, Zverev and um, and Medvedev has been moving crowds wherever they go. Uh, remember in Wimbledon when um, actually Medvedev got to play into a small outside court against Orcash, you couldn't even find the seat. People were queuing from like meters and meters. I think it was on court two to try to get in and get a seat. For me, it's it's really a debate I don't understand. I've been, I mean, being on the side of a player when I used to play, being on the side of the media now, I just don't understand why people try to change the personality of a player. You are who you are. You know, Rafa has his own personality. When he comes on court, he's just himself. And you can't just ask somebody to just duplicate or replicate who someone used to be. You are who you are. You come with your personality. There's just so much difficulty so much stress, too much on the line when you're playing a tennis match. I mean, honestly, it's so hard already. Why you have to behave in a certain way that people, you know, ask you to behave like? It's, it's, it's uncontrollable. You can't control this. You're behaving. You're just trying to react to a very stressful situation and trying to just do the best you can do and trying to win matches. That's already a lot to do. You can't possibly think, oh, my gosh, I have to behave that way so the crowd will like me. And then Rafa used to do this and used to have so much charisma, so I have to do it as well because then the crowd will like me. It's just impossible. You come on the court the way you are. And yes, we have been very spoiled to have for 20 years, you know, Roger and Rafa coming with so different personality that people could actually sit on either one side or the other, but no one was in the middle. You either love Rafa or love Roger. And, and that rivalry just brings the whole sport. But I remember just, you know, reading some stuff about Pete Sampras. Oh, Pete Sampras is boring. Are you kidding me? I mean, the guy just inspired generation and generation of players. He was the idol of Roger, of, of Novak, of so many players because he was just winning. You know, who cares if you have the person you have under Agassi or not? You just come as you are as a player. And I think it's entirely false and wrong to judge someone on their personality. You have to judge them of what they're winning, what they're able to bring on the court, the, the, the tennis level they're bringing. And for those guys, I mean, can you imagine, I don't know, 15 years ago, someone from two meters tall, tall couldn't move on the court. Those guys now, they run probably the 100 meter dash in 11 seconds. Can you imagine the, the amount of work they have to put in every day to be at that level physically? When you look at uh, the match between uh, Novak and, and Sasha at, uh, at the Masters, the amount of rallies, the amount of running they were doing, and then 15 seconds later, you have to be ready and play another point. I mean, that to me is extraordinary. And if we're not able as a media to explain that to a crowd saying that is extraordinary enough for you to appreciate it, we're not doing our job properly to understand how difficult it is, how much you have to put on the line every single day of work to get to that level. And that's our part. That's our job. That's why I think it's great that the media is taking ex players because I think as an ex player, you're understanding you can relate to that amount of effort. That's our job to explain okay. how hard it is. And, and that should be the whole point behind it. Sverev has a, a problem in the fact that he is, he is the subject of allegations uh, of abuse from an ex-girlfriend and is being investigated by the ATP. And it's hard, I imagine, for a lot of people to get behind him. But in terms of, in terms of game styles being attractive or not, I think it's, it's impossible to get away from the fact that two baseliners going at it is not necessarily in itself that interesting all the time what makes it interesting is when there's a, a story to go alongside it when you've got an Andy Murray who's been struggling 
four Grand Slam final losses in a row to get there to try and beat Novak or or Rafa and Novak going head to head or Roger and Rafa who've you know you know so much about them you've invested a lot of time in their personality as well as their game and so you you then have a lot more interest in it it's like if you suddenly got shown a match between two players you'd never seen before and you know what makes what makes it interesting the game style will be the first thing that you see so if the two people are the same it's not easy to get behind it. I think it's just it's just something that builds. It, it will build a lot. I'm sure that, you know, I find Medvedev quite interesting to watch when it's against a more attacking player or someone, you know, a Dimitrov or a, someone, someone who's got a little bit extra about them or a TFO or someone who can do something different. You know, Carlos Alcaraz is a, generally a baseliner. He can come forward, but he's got something about him that gives him that charisma on the court. Even if he... You know, he's not pumping his fist all the time, but he cracks that ball. And when he makes that, when it makes that noise, the crowd go, you know, ooh, and, and then they get excited. And that's that's what uh, that's what's lacking from a Zverev in particular and maybe a Medvedev a little bit when they play each other. It's also really right to say, honestly, the, the problem is that we have to watch and write about Sasha Zverev knowing that the guy is investigated for, for, for abuse and that it, it took ages to get to the point where he's investigating. It's also a problem that it's not the, let's just say, the easiest player to work with as a media. It's not the most polite player we have on tour. It's not the nicest and collaborative player we have on tour. So he goes on the court and you're like, it's going to be complicated. So, it, and I mean, it, it plays a part. It, it has to play a part. I think Medvedev it's different. He has a funky game. I agree with Simon. It's better when he's in a, you know, um, a, um, what do you say that? A position of, of styles. But we are going to get to know them. Um, I fully agree with what Marion said. It's our, our job to explain to people about all the hard work. And we keep doing this. The thing we can't deny is the X factor is that it's also a show. And sometimes, I mean, the crowd is going to be the judge. The tickets sold are going to be the judges. The TV rights will be the judge. I went to see matches. Nobody cared about just because I love the style of the players that were playing. But I mean, we know that in, at the end of the day, if they want to keep their prize money, if you want to keep the tournaments alive, we're going to need uh, the star potential and we are going to need people weeks in, weeks out on, 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 you know, watching those matches. So we maybe have to ask some time, but it's good to ask the question, are we having a problem or not? I don't think we have one now. Could we have one in five years? Possibly. Yeah, I just think one thing tennis does badly or doesn't do well is the technical side of things. You know, like if you ever watch a golf tournament, they do a really great job of getting the players down and showing things about their swing. They're not afraid to talk about technique or about little intricacies that make their their swing different to someone else's or what they're trying to do when they're out there. And I, I've always thought it would be a good idea for TV channels, you know, there's a lot of dead time in between matches, to get the players in and talk about, you know, talk more about what they're doing on the court and how they're doing it. I, I'd I would love to see that. Maybe that's because I'm a bit of a tennis geek, but that's what I'd like to see. All right, let's move ahead now. It's prediction time for 2022. Let's begin on the men's side. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you three options. You're going to quickly tell me which one of the three you are choosing, and if you want one sentence behind the why. On the men's side, which is most likely of the three? A, Federer returns to a Grand Slam semi. B, Yannick Sinner or Carlos Alcarez play in a slam final, or C, or the final option C, Daniil Medvedev becomes world number one. Is it A, is it B, is it C? Which is most likely in a sentence or two as to why? Carol, you go first. Well, I think this one is, I want to say easy. I think C, Medvedev getting to number one is so close. And I feel Sinner and Alcaraz are going to go to the, I mean, especially Alcaraz is just learning really. Um, so if he plays the final next year, I mean, good for him. And I would be wrong, but I think yeah, Medvedev going to number one. Well, I'm going to take a bold bet, <laughs> but I will go with Roger making the semis of Wimbledon next year. I would love to say that Federer makes a semi in 2022, but I can't see it. I'm not sure when he's going to come back. Hopefully he'll come back strong, but maybe it'll be a bit too soon. I think probably, I'm going to go Alcaraz to make a final. I think he's got a, such an explosive game. If he puts it all together and learns as fast as he has been, he can do it. All right, to the women's side now, which of these is most likely to happen? Is it A, Ash Barty confirms her number one ranking by winning multiple slam trophies? B, Coco Golf wins her first major, or C, Emma Redencanu reaches the top eight and plays her first WTA finals. A, B, or C. Let's go reverse order. Simon Cambers, you go first. 
I will say that the most likely is for Ash Barty to win more slams. I think she's very happy. She's just getting she's getting married. Uh, we heard today. Uh, yeah, she's uh, announced her engagement. So she's obviously in a very good place. She's her game is there. She is ultra confident. She can play on every surface. I think she will win more slams in 2022. I think most likely the first two can happen. I think Ash can stay number one and win win Grand Slam, and and still Coco can go and win one. Um, especially on clay, when she played really well in Roland Garros this year. And she could, I mean, with slightly more experience, she could uh, absolutely go down all the way and and, and leave the trophy um, instead of Barbara Krishitova. So I can definitely see the first two. I, I agree with Simon. I think Emma needs slightly more time. Okay, I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to say Goff is going to win her first uh, Grand Slam because I agree with Marion. In Roland Garros, this year she was close. Um, so I, yeah, let's take a risk. Let's go with Goff. I'm glad that you answered as such because that leads us to our final question. And it reads, this is, it reads verbatim. If not Coco Goff, based on what you've seen at the end of this season, whom is now most likely to win her first major championship in 2022? If not Coco, then whom? Marion, let me guess you're going to take the field. To win a Grand Slam, it just takes several components. And I think Badoza is physically so strong that she can she can go all the way for seven matches, absolutely. Uh, but yet, Contavid, I mean, winning four titles the way she did, handling the pressure and still qualifying for her first tour final and making it all the way to the final and play a great final against Darbigny. That was really epic as well. I'm between Sabalenka, Contavid, Badosa, and I get a crazy Anisimova coming back from the funk she's in. And I know, I said crazy because I love her back and it's completely ridiculous. Um, but I think <laughs> Badosa, Contavid, or Sabalenka, I'd love Sabalenka because she's been close and she wants it so bad and she's crazy funny. I love her game. Um, but I feel Badosa is really, really... So strong, as Marion said, it's so tough. It's so tough. As I'm going to go with Sabalenka because I, she has a bit more experience and I, she was close this year. And I feel like her time, her time should come. Let's let's be crazy. Let's go with Sabalenka. I would love to say that Ons Jabeur would win one, but I think she'll probably find somebody always a little bit too good at the end of the tournament. I, I hope she does, but uh, I love the way she plays. But I think Maria Sakkari is the one who is improving steadily every single year, getting better. If she can get that mental strength right up to the level that you need to to win a slam, I think she's got everything else she needs. So I'll go Sakkari. Fair enough. Marion Bartoli, Carol Bouchard, Simon Cambers, thank you as always, our esteemed esteemed panel. Make sure you check in on TennisMajors.com each and every day for updates, not just on the situation in China, but the very latest in all of tennis. For our panel, Josh Cohen saying thank you for watching. We will see you next time for more Match Points right here on TennisMajors.com.